In today's show, we are looking at Thursday's action across the NBA. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your next order. Let's talk about those games from Thursday. First one. Lakers Heat. The Heat win at 110-104. The Lakers were without Anthony Davis and LeBron James, of course, but then Taylor Horton Tucker was suspended and Kyle Kuzma is out. So the rotation is not particularly indicative of what's going to happen moving forward. Let's focus on Andre Drummond, who played 27 minutes in his second game for the Lakers. Look, the numbers are fine. They're really good, actually. 15 and 12 with two steals, 83 from the line, 56 from the field. Look, really, really strong stuff. Really good stuff. Um, that does. That's fine. They still lost. Um... He is a guy that is a must roster, clearly. And I think Montrez Harrell is going to be a drop. He played 21 minutes, Harrell, 10 and 9 with two steals. And it remains unfathomable to me that you do not play Marc Gasol. Gasol out of the rotation entirely. A clear drop, obviously, because he's not going to play, but absolutely ridiculous coaching, in my opinion. KCP went off, 28 points with six triples. Don't expect anything like this from KCP, who's the 236th ranked player this year, but he just was able to get some shots to fall, and his usage was sky high. Well, Schroeder had 10, 6, and 14, and Wes Matthews started with Kuz and had 14 points, three triples, two steals, and a block. A nice game from Wes, but again, we're not really basing anything off this one. With all those players out, Ben McLemore was able to make his Lakers debut. He had six points in 17 minutes. I'm not sure that if Kuzma and Horton Tucker are playing, and then, of course, if Davis and LeBron are playing, that McLemore's even going to be part of the rotation. In fact, I'd say that he almost definitely won't be. But he can be a guy that if these guys remain out, you know, Kuzma or Horton Tucker won't because he'll be back next game. But, you know, McLemore, best case, is the 10th bloke. Best case, maybe he's the 13th player. Absolutely no fantasy value, in my opinion, um, for him. For the Heat, Jim Butler had 28, 7, and 5 with three steals. Excellent shooting. A true shooting of 86, 92 from the line. While Adebayo had uh, just the 13 points in 28 minutes. He had some foul trouble. That kept the playing time down. He still had two blocks with seven rebounds and four assists, but not his best night. And then Precious Achua came in and had like four fouls in four minutes to replace Bam. Ended with 7 and 5 in nine minutes. Victor Oladipo, unfortunately, like this was his, he was looking good in this game. 25 minutes, 18 points, two triples, three steals, and a block. And then he hurt his knee. And we don't know what the stat status is. He didn't return. He went up for a dunk and landed. And he was like, oh, and that's it. He was done. We'll get an update tomorrow. Um, he's not playing that well. But this was good. But he, in general, hasn't played that well this year. If you're in the playoff hunt, you're in the playoffs, and Oladipo is like reevaluated in seven days, you got to move on. You can't be getting zeros in situations like that from a guy who's not even you know, top 30 when he comes back. Dunk Robinson had 11 points. Tyler Hero had 15 with four triples in 31 minutes, while Ariza, eight points in 27. Ariza's got that role pretty locked in, that 28-minute, 30-minute starting power forward role, but it's 14, 16-team leagues only, while Goran Dragic is only a 14-team league guy, in my opinion, as well, 10 points in 26 minutes. But if Oladipo misses time, maybe we see Kendrick Nunn get back into the rotation. Not that he's going to come in and play 30 minutes. I don't think that'll happen, but maybe he can play 24 minutes, and that might have some deeper league appeal. So just be aware that we might be seeing a return of Kendrick none into the rotation if Oladipo does have to miss some time. Let's go on to the next game. The Bulls beat the Raptors 122-113. Good to see Zach Levine put up some big numbers. 22-6-13 with three steals and a block. Well, Thomas Sadoransky, the seven assists are nice. The extremely low usage isn't. Nine points in 30 minutes. I still think that Sadoransky is a 12-team league guy, really just on the back of those assists alone. Nikola Vucevic. It's Bulls. It's Bulls. Bulls is 22, Boots 7, and 4 is pretty strong. Well, Pat Williams was just we was solid across the board. 11 and 7 with a triple one. Like, that's totally fine. It's totally stream worthy, especially on a back to back. But he's more of a 14 to 16 team league guy. Lowry Markinen, look at this, plus 23, 80% shooting. That's all awesome, except he played just 18 minutes. And that to me is a pretty big indictment. Now, the 18 points are nice. But three rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks. I do not think that Larry Markinen is a must-roster player. Get 
that garbage out of here! They keep starting Thad Young and playing him like 24 minutes. He had 11, 9, and 6. It's because they're playing Patrick Williams in his preferred position or his best position, which I do like. I'm still holding Young, but those minutes aren't great. And what they're doing is they're giving extra minutes to Kobe White, who played 27 here. 15, 3, and 1 with 3 threes. And he's still empty in many areas. He's more of a streamer. You consider him a streamer in the Gary Trent type of mold, which we'll talk about in a second. A guy that can get some points and threes, but not a guy that I look at as a guaranteed must trust. Although those increasing minutes are not. We also saw Daniel Tice play 27 minutes. He had a double-double, 14 and 10. I don't know that I believe Daniel Tice is a 25, 26-minute-a-night player. I'd be pretty surprised, in fact, if that's going to be the case. But, hey, you never know that he might find himself in a role that uh, that has some fantasy appeal somehow, some way. All right, let's go on to the Raptors now. Of course, the big one there is the wiki, Chris Boucher. 36 minutes, 38 points, 19 rebounds, 3 triples, 33% usage, a team best plus 16, 58 shooting, 88 from the line. Like, this is amazing stuff. 67 fantasy points. We know this is amazing. Not one person has ever doubted that Chris Boucher will put up big numbers if he gets big minutes. And we saw the proof of it today. But they are signing Ken Birch, apparently. What does that mean for Boucher? Um, is this a sell high? Holy shit, if you can get any top 50 numbers for him, it's it, it's impossible. But if you could, you do it. I just don't know what this means for Boucher. It's great. But everyone knew that he could have big games. Like This is not a surprise to me. It's not a surprise to Nick Nurse. It's not a surprise to you. But the concern is, is when the hell do those minutes come? We just don't know. Like They are so all over the place that it is impossible. And Nurse clearly thinks that he's a backup four, not a starting five. And I think if they put Ken Birch there, that he might just get 22 minutes a night backing up the four and the five. I think that's a possibility. But it's obviously awesome, and you need to just keep holding Boucher because I don't think we're ever going to get a full answer as to whether he is um, you know, an 18-minute, a 26-minute. We don't know. It's just going to change all the time. Siakam was pretty good, 27-8 and eight with three blocks, while uh, Malachi Flynn. There's a good nickname for Flynn sitting in here, and I don't exactly know what it is. I am going to figure it out, though. Um, there is a good nickname for him, though. I'll, I'll figure it out. Nine points in 35 minutes with three triples, eight assists and two steals. Didn't shoot particularly well, 27%. I, I believe this guy's a player. We've got at least one more game with Van Vliet out. I don't expect Lara to be back next game. Bembry will return though, but I think Flynn is, is uh, pretty good value for the back-to-back -back over the weekend, and then we'll see what happens after that. Well, the Jedi, OG Ananobi. But what about Scarf? OG, Blizzard stop works. OG. Uh, you better stop OG. Some pretty rough efficiency, 29%, but 13, 4, and 6 with three steals is nice. Otherwise, well, Gary Trent, now I know I've bang on about this all the time. And the reason I do talk about this is that people get so wet worked up about things that happen in short-term things. And I think I, I said this, I go, yeah, Gary Trent shooting 55% or whatever was over three games. So he's going to fall and he's going to fall hard. Six points in 39 minutes on 14% shooting. And of course, when you do sweet FA else, and kids, if you don't know what FA means, it means fuck all. That's where you have a bad night. One rebound, one assist, zero steals, zero blocks. He now, despite this hot streak that he's on, is the 197th ranked player over the last two weeks in 33 minutes. Gary Trent. Get that garbage out of here! Look, I know with no Lowry and no Van Vliet, he's going to get shots. He's going to fluctuate. He is a points and threes streamer. And when one of those blokes comes back, don't have any hassle with moving on. He shouldn't start, really. It should be Van Vliet. It should be Lowry. It should be Ananobi, Siakam, and then a Birch-Boucher combination. They might go with Siakam back at center and Trent gets those minutes. But let's be fair. He's played 31 minutes a game this season, Gaza, and he's a 172nd ranked player. That if, you, if I saw him on a 12-team roster, I would say, oh, well, that's... Fine. That's no problem at all. If I saw him on a 12-team waiver, I would say literally exactly the same thing. And that, to me, is the definition of not a must-roster player. If I saw Blake Griffin on a 12-team league roster, I'd say, what on earth are you doing? But if I saw Gary Trent, I'd go, oh, okay, you probably need that points and threes. But he is in no way, in no way, a must-roster player. And I'm pretty sure the last couple of games would, again, reinforce that idea, although people get caught up when a player shoots 56% from three for three games and think that they're the second coming of the greatest shooter of all time, when we know that it's going to fall off. We, we just know that that's going to happen. Guys, you want the best-tasting protein bar ever? You know what it is? It is Built Bar. I'm going to show you my Built Bar. This is my last one, so I've been savoring it. I'm waiting for my new boxes to arrive. Coconut Almond Built Bar. 
Low calorie, low sugar, high protein, high fiber bars. They taste just like candy bars and they're covered in 100% chocolate. They are soft and easy to chew. And these, this, what's this bar got on? Let's have a look at its nutritional value. As I just do this live, you can hear the rustle of the, of the wrapper. We are looking at five grams of sugar with 18 grams of protein. That's pretty good. Pretty happy with that. Um, yeah, that's, there's some good numbers for sure. And what else am I looking at on here? Where, is, where are the total calories? Oh, no, I can't find it, but this ad's gone for too long now. Anyway, Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar. And if you want to go buy yourself a box, which you should, go to builtbar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you get 15% off your next order. The promo code is LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D, 1515 for 15% off at builtbar.com. On to the next game, the Cavs beat the Thunder. I wrote this one up in my Betfair article talking about um, how I thought that the, the line of minus two to the Cavs seemed ridiculously low. It uh, is obviously ridiculously low because they won easily. 129-102, the artist formerly known as Torian Prince. Three big games in a row for Princey. 22 points, six assists, 28 minutes. Do I believe it? Not for a single second. Allen and Nance will come back at some point and that'll cut into Prince's minutes. But the Discman Chetty Osman is just out of the rotation, and Prince is getting those minutes. As a short-term streamer, I, I don't hate it. Same as I don't hate the short-term stream for Dean Wadey Wade, who had a Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. He had 12 points, four rebounds, three assists, two steals, two blocks, and two triples. Good night from Wade. Well, Love played 23 minutes and was pretty good as well. 18 and 11 with three threes. Now, I worry about Love's longevity, but for now, he's a 12-team league streamable guy. Garland had 21, 3, and 5. Good numbers from him. Same as Colin Sexton, 27, 3, and 4 on 53% shooting. And Sexton, impressively, to the line 10 times and hit 9 of them. So good numbers all around. While my boy, Isaiah Hartenstein, continues to rack up the big ones. 8, 12, and 6 in 27 minutes. Of course, like Prince and like Wade, Allen and Nance being out is helping Hartenstein. He can have some short-term value. I do believe this guy can be a good fantasy player, but it's just not going to be a long-term thing. Well, Isaac Okoro had 15 points. He didn't do a huge amount else. And Okoro is now the 250th ranked player this season. He had, he had uh, 21 fantasy points here. He's not really any sort of option outside of very, very deep leagues, unfortunately. For the Thunder, they made a move today. They waived Darius Miller. And they're going to bring in Gabriel Deck from Real Madrid, the Argentinian 26-year-old, six foot six, small forward. But there's just so many unknowns with projecting this team. The rotation players that are out, well, not even including Horford, Gildas Alexander, Baisley, Roby, and Dort are all out. Josh Hall was a rotation player as well, and he's out too. So I don't know what Alexei Pokyshevsky's minutes going to be like. He wasn't particularly good here. 10 points on 25% shooting. He did have two threes and two blocks, though. But he wasn't particularly good. I don't know what Sfima Haluk's minutes are going to be. He had 27 here for 10 points, two triples, which is fine as a short-term deeper league stream. But Shea and Dort, if they come back, do they just cut into his minutes? The Salt Flake, Theo Maladon. Theo Maladon had 14, 2, and 4, but shot horribly. Ty Jerome played well. 23 minutes, 23 points in 32 minutes on 56% shooting. But again... Where are the minutes? It's so hard to project project this stuff. And the C parter, a good game after yesterday's stinker. We, I talked about him not being a 25% shooter because that was pretty obvious. Um, and he, well, he bounced back. 13 and 11 with a steal and a block on 60% shooting and made his only free throw. That's useful enough for 12-team leagues. I think he's still probably a 10-team drop, but in 12s, I'm okay with it. He played a little bit with Tony Bradley as well. Not much, a couple of minutes. 5, 4, and 3 for Bradley with two blocks, who's more of a deeper league sort of guy. But this rotation's all over the place. Uh, the Oklahoma City mudflap, Kenrich Williams, 12, 7, and 9, two steals and two threes, played 31 minutes. Short term, absolutely a 12-team league guy, but Baisley, Roby, Dort, Shea, they're all going to cut into his playing time. And does he even play? Is he even in the rotation when all those guys come back? <coughs> I have no idea. Because if Shea, Baisley, Roby, Dort, they're all ahead of him, for sure. They're all going to be in. Pokashevsky's going to be in. Maladon's going to be in. Then, uh, but I don't know who where they go from there. So while it's great in the short term to have Williams and to stream Poku and to stream Mahaluk and to add Maladon, it could all go pear-shaped in a week when those guys return. And yeah, I think Maladon still plays his 30 minutes, but Poku might play 22. Williams might play 17. Svee may be out of the rotation. Moses Brown might be playing 20 minutes a night as him and Roby and Bradley all share those minutes. There are so many question marks with that rotation, which makes it pretty frustrating to try and project that out for fantasy. All right, on to the next game. The Dallas Mavericks comfortably handle the Milwaukee Bucks, 116-101. The big ragu, Dante DiVincenzo, had 22 points with six triples. Good game from him. Good to see that production uh, remain. He is a 12-team league guy. Of course, there was no 
Yanni Antetokounmpo, so punch Bob shit bloke. Bobby Portis played 35 minutes and had 20 and 14 and was a minus 17, and nobody's surprised with that. But he does have value. As long as Yanni is out, he's putting up good numbers. Lopez had 16 points, and Drew Holiday, it was always going to come crashing back at some point. Tim Worst, minus 24 for Drew also. 13 points on 16 shots with five rebounds and three assists, and uh, Middleton had 14 and 8 on 22% shooting. That's horrendous. Uh, 33 usage for Middleton for a true shooting of 26%. Just a horrible, horrible night all around for him. Uh, Jeff Teague had six points, couldn't continue his good form. Shocked I am. Well, Bryn Forbes had three points and missed all four of his shots. Also, absolutely flummoxed that that happened. Paddy Connaughton had four and seven with two steals. Um, but honestly, just a shit night from the Bucks in general. It was a back-to-back. Kristaps -back. Porzingis. Porzingis. He played. He played 33 minutes. He had 26-17 with four triples and two blocks. I mentioned this earlier today that, you know, long-term guaranteed definitive statements about back-to-backs are always going to blow up in your face. KP is going to sit every back-to-back. -back. Is he? No. Mike Conley, never going to play a back-to-back. -back. Is he? No. Kawhi, never playing back-to-backs. Sure, but he is. So all these things are always subject to change. Luka Doncic, 27-9-9. Shit house from the line, but good from the field, 55%. And Joshy Richardson bounced back from a couple of really stinking performances. In fact, he's had a, a ton of stinkers. He's 231st over the last two weeks, Josh. But 14-5-4 and four with two steals is nice. And Muxy Kleber returned for a big one. 12 points, four triples, two steals. Kleber is just that fringe 12-team league guy, more of a 14-teamer. And Dorian Finney-Smith the same. Now, the three blocks from uh, Dodo are fine. But well, look at that shooting. 33 from the line. 30% from the field. But the 10 boards, the two threes, the three steals are okay. Timmy Hardaway fell off, as did Jalen Brunson. 12 points for Tim and two points for Brunson. Um, I still prefer Brunson over Hardaway as a 12 team, but they are very, very far from being must-roster guys. They're just streamer, end-of-the-roster type players that you can get away with, but you can also uh, yeah, not feel too excited about having them some of the time. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet. On all of your sports action, football might be over, but the NBA and the NHL are in full swing, and BetOnline even covers awards, TV shows, and reality TV. Real-time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. BetOnline has you covered for all of the news, scores, and odds. It's the best way to place your bets, and it's free to sign up. Head to the website, betonline.ag, or use your mobile device to sign up today using our promo code LOCKEDON, one word, and you receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline are your online sportsbook experts. All right, so let's go on to the next game. We're looking at the Detroit Pistons beating the Kings 113-101. Of course, revenge game, Corey Joseph. 32 minutes, 24 points, 7 assists, 1 steal, 1 block. He shot 71% from the field, 80% from the line. Um, I don't know what Dwayne Casey is doing half of the time. The rotations never make any sense. There was no Jeremy Grant or Mason Plumley in this one. Their previous starting point guard, uh, Saban Lee, was benched. Corey Joseph started at the two. They pushed Josh Jackson up to the three. Nothing makes any sense with these rotations. Playing 32 minutes for Corey Joseph on a team that's going nowhere makes a, a, zero sense as well. Now, Joseph can be a stream option, but I have seen Corey Joseph play for Indiana. I have seen him play for Toronto. I have seen him play for Sacramento. I am now seeing him play for Detroit. And one thing I know about Corey Joseph is, in general, when he gets big minutes, he does absolutely nothing with them. He is playing at a high level at the moment. There is no doubt about that. 106th ranked player over the last two weeks. Is that anywhere near sustainable? I don't believe so. But if you want to take a flyer, by all means, I probably won't. With no Mason Plumley, Isaiah Stewart started. He had 16, 13, and 4. I believe that Isaiah Stewart is a must-roster player. Plumley will continue to sit games. Plumley will continue to have minutes limited down the stretch, I think. But I don't care. I just want to have Stewart and see where it goes. The depressed penis played 35 minutes. Sadiq Bay, 12 points, two threes, two steals. He is just wildly inconsistent. We know that. Big game last time out, but still not a top 200 player over the last two weeks. He can be a 12-team league guy for sure, but I wouldn't have him as must roster. While Killian Hayes, there were people who were pretty quick to label Killian Hayes as a bust after seven games. He played 21 minutes here, 11 points on 71% shooting. Not a real number. That's not going to continue, obviously. But I think he just looks good out there. One three, two assists, one block. I would like to see him get some starts and play more minutes. I don't understand playing him only 21 minutes here, considering he played 25 in the last game. But surely, again, the part of the confusion with Casey is yeah, he started him from the very first moment of the season, brings him back, and now plays him fewer minutes. I don't. I think we just got to see, get him 28 minutes, and let's see what he can do. But I am thinking that if you've got a little bit of a buffer. And you can take a little bit of a break in terms of maybe some current production, although Hayes was still really good here. I think you add Killian Hayes, and let's just see what happens as it moves forward. 
Jalil Okafor return. Remember him? 11 points in 15 minutes for Jaleel as the backup center. He won't play most nights when Plumlee's there. Well, let's. I think it's time for us to have a discussion about MC Hamadou Diallo. Stop. The thing is, it's not hammer time. It's never been hammer time. I don't think it's ever going to be hammer time. I think he was worth a fly, but as I stressed a million times about Diallo, he's not as good of a shooter as we have seen in this little stretch to begin in Detroit. He's a guy that had those big games in Oklahoma City where he played 37 a night and he was the only guard on the court, so he's getting all these numbers. He's a um, an up and down free throw shooter for sure. I just don't think he's as good as what the highlights or as what people would lead you to believe. And only 17 minutes here with Frank Jackson playing eight, eight absolutely useless minutes of Wayne Ellington, 32 minutes of Corey Joseph, 21 minutes of Killian Hayes, 27 minutes of Dennis Smith Jr. Is Diallo ever going to get to start or play 30 minutes? I have to say the answer is no. Now, in a points league, he has got way more value than a category league. But again, I just think the idea of Hamadou Diallo, the highlights of Hamadou Diallo, are significantly better than the reality of Hamadou Diallo and the fantasy value of Hamadou Diallo. That shooting was never going to stick, and it fell off, and we got whatever this bullshit is. If you want to hold him, by all means. I just don't think that it's worth it in most cases. Speaking of Dennis Smith, literally out of the rotation, and now he's starting and playing 27 minutes. If you can make it make sense, I'd love to know what the answer is. Now, he wasn't particularly good. Eight points with four assists, but is he at least you know, taking Saban Lee out of things, which is something I think should have happened because he's got way more of a future than Lee. Um, the ideal thing is Hayes plays 30, Smith plays 20. They overlap for a little bit. I think that is the common sense decision to, to make, but it's Dwayne Casey, and common sense decisions have never been something that he, he would highlight on his resume. Smith is just that deeper Lee guy at this point, uh, but we want to watch that. Frank Jackson, who's been shooting the absolute lights out this year. I do not believe that Jackson is a very good NBA player. He had five points in 14 minutes. And the refusal to play Sekou Dumbaya, even in a scenario where Grant is out, when you can just put Sekou at the four, instead of trying to shoehorn Josh Jackson, who, let's be honest, is not good either, into those minutes is, again, a frustrating decision. Now, Sekou hasn't necessarily lit the, world, lit the world on fire, but I'd like to see a little bit more from a bloke who's 20 years old in his second NBA season, who's had the misfortune to be coached by Dwayne Casey for both of those years. Six points in 13 minutes for Siku. And I reckon that covers me shitting on Dwayne Casey. And in in all seriousness, they won the game. Because the bloke on the other side's a worse coach, but they won the game. But it's still that's not the that's not the purpose for the Pistons this year. Winning games is all well and good, but winning them in the right way, I think, is even more important. And by the right way, that is getting the players who are going to be playing the roles when your team becomes good in that position to succeed rather than getting 32 minutes of Corey Joseph. You can disagree with that as much as you want. Getting a win might be super important to you. It it shouldn't be. For the Kings, they made a change to their starting lineup. They put Tyrese Halliburton to the bench, and they started Mo Harkless. Cool. Harkless was minus eight. This team is not good. They've lost five in a row. And Walton's a shithouse coach. Rashawn Holmes had some foul trouble. That's why he played just 25 minutes, 15 and 9 with two steals and two blocks. And even in that foul trouble, Hassan Whiteside played only 11 minutes. We probably won't get to do this again, but let's go one more time. The world. He absolutely sucks. 10 points in 11 minutes for Whiteside. He is still rostered in 39% of advanced leagues. If you're one of those people who are holding on to Hassan Whiteside, explain yourself in the comments. Get your fingers out of your asses. And drop him. What the hell are we doing? Darren Fox, we thought maybe the free throws had improved. Maybe not. 64% from the line here. He did pick it up late. 23, 9, and 7. It was a pretty rough game from him. While Bud Heald continues to be, instead of 36 minutes, 32, 33. 15 points, 5 triples, and 4 um, four rebounds. And of course, because it was a Corey Joseph revenge game, that must mean that we had a massive game from DeLon Wright against his former team, the player that Corey Joseph was traded for. Because that's how revenge games work, of course. DeLon Wright had 5 points in 22 minutes. DeLon Wright is a clear drop. In fact, Jack, what should we do? Here. Surely everyone's moved on from now, but if you haven't, get rid of him. The pencil Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. <laughs> Look, just thoroughly average. 13, 4, and 2 is fine, but it's not good. 42% is not good. Just This is the Barnes of old. This is the Barnes that we've seen for years and years and years. He's doing stuff that's not particularly good. And that's where we are with, uh, with Harrison. All right, next game, we've got the Portland Trailblazers. They got smacked by the Utah Jazz. Yusuf Nurkic returned. He played 22 minutes. He had 10-6-4 in a triple one. And that would get me turgid 
if I had any confidence that he'd break through the minutes limit. They are great numbers. They are very good. Now, he is, over the last two weeks, the 140th ranked player in 20 minutes a game. Like, they are really good numbers. When the hell is he going to play 30 minutes? That's the problem. I am holding him because I know that is good, and I know he's better than this, but I just don't know when it's coming. McCollum had 19-3-2 with a steal a block. And guess what, guys? It was another subpar Damian Lillard night. He struggled this year next to McCollum, weirdly. 23-5-6 on a true shooting of 49%. Couldn't hit free throws. Couldn't hit shots from the field. Had no defensive stats. He is struggling. And I would say he's a buy low, but I'm not sure that he's that much of a buy low. 39th ranked player over the last two weeks. Eighth for the season. I, we're seeing some big downturns. Ennis Cantor, you can drop him with Nurkic back 8-7 and seven in 21 minutes. While Storm and Norman Powell... This is what I was worried about with Powell the whole season in Toronto, yet he kept shooting at like 50% from three all year. And I said, at some point, it's going to drop off. Now he's gone to Portland. He had 13 points in 34 minutes with one steal, zero blocks, 40% shooting. Um, And he's not a droppable player, but some of the shine is coming off a little bit, I think, here. Carmelo Anthony was actually atrocious. Not minus 19 and 17 minutes, seven points. I think the signing of Rondé Hollis Jefferson is going to hurt Derek Jones Jr. and it's going to hurt Carmelo Anthony. The Mello and Cantor pairing is an indictment on Stotts as a coach, and Stotts has done pretty well most of the t- time. But playing those two together is actually indefensible, and they got absolutely ass rooted in this one. They were they were not a good combination at all. For the Jazz, Don Mitchell, big game, 37, five and four, eight of eight from the line. He's gone. Is good. While Rudy Gobert had 18 and 21 with two blocks. They're just really good. There was no Geordie Clarkson, so 35 minutes from Jingle and Joe. 13, 4, and 6 with two steals. I said that Joe might be a drop, but you want to hold him for Thursday because Conley's likely to rest. Well, Conley didn't rest. Uh, Clarkson was out, and Ingles put up those good numbers. So we're holding him for now. Boyan Bogdanovich is just a streamer. 11 points in 28 minutes. Well, it was a bad night from Conley. 11 points, only 23 minutes. I think that's the back-to-back and the blowout. Uh, Shot 25%. That's rough from Mick, but he is obviously better than that. While Royce O'Neal, he's not a 12-team league player. He's a streamer. He can help in little bits to fill your holes. Where's my button? Giggity. Where's my button deserves a giggity as well. Giggity. Um, But he's far from a must-roster player. And I think that does it for the Utah Jazz. All right, so let's look at the last game of the night. The Suns go down to the Clippers, 113-103. In the end, Phoenix, DeAndre Ayton, pretty good again. 18 and 10 on 82% shooting. No free throw attempts, though, continues to be that worry. But a couple of good games there. Well, as I said yesterday, if anyone was going to drop McCall Bridges, you needed to go and add him because that wasn't representative of what he does. 20 points in 36 minutes with three threes. It's a great game. Well, Chris Paul, a revenge game. 13 points on 36% shooting with three assists and zero threes. Not the greatest from Chris, quite obviously. Well, Devin Booker was also pretty down. Neither Chris Paul nor Devin Booker hit a three. 24 points for Booker with three rebounds and three assists and a triple zero. Pretty rough night. Speaking of rough nights. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Jay Crowder had zero points. He attempted just two shots. He did have four assists, two steals, and a block. He's a 14-team league guy and not a 12-team league player. Well, Dario Saric was horrible. 13 minutes for two points. He, they just got killed when he was out there. This was just a, not a good night from the Suns. For the Clippers... Let's talk Rajon Rondo, who's been atrocious all season and had a big one here. 15, 3, and 9 with three threes for Rondo. 63% shooting. Hit both his free throws. Absolutely everything about this line is completely unrealistic, but a plus 24, he was actually really good, and it helped because Patrick Beverly got ejected. And, of course, um, the dickhead Marcus Morris also got ejected um, in the last minute of the game. He is just an absolute knob, that guy. Like, honestly, he shits me more than almost any player in the NBA. Paul George was great. I still worry a little bit about his toe and his foot, but 33 points, seven triples, seven rebounds, three assists, two steals. He's always a guy that goes undervalued in drafts or you can get as buy lows in trades because people just love making jokes. Hey, way off P. Pandemic P. Paul George is faking it. He's dizzy from coffee. Like They love it. They love it. And it should work to your advantage in fantasy because you can always get him late. You could have got him in the 30s in drafts. 20, mid-20s at the, at the best, right? And he's the 16th ranked player. He, when he struggles, when he gets hurt, you get him for nothing. Like, people just hate this bloke. Kawhi Leonard had 27-5-5, five and, five, and I understand why, because he's irritating at times, but it, it goes too far. 27-5-5 five and five with three threes for Kawhi, while Marcus Morris had eight points in his 30 minutes. Marcus Morris is not a 12-team league player. Um, Beverly, zero points in 17 minutes. Terrence Mann out of the rotation. DeMarcus Cousins did not play a single second, despite Ibaka not being there. Again, if you added DeMarcus Cousins, and he's rostered in 24% of leagues. Please. Please move on. 
Patrick Patterson had 19 minutes for seven points. Patrick Patterson is playing more than DeMarcus Cousins. And Ty Luke can come out and say, yeah, man, we really, we love it. He's like a combination of Zubats and Ibaka. We hope you can stay more than our 10-day. And then Cousins goes, Ty, are you going to play me? He goes, fuck no. What are, you, what are you talking about? You're not going out there. What do you think this is? I'm only saying that shit because it's the media. You're not playing. And I feel so, I love Boogie. Great. He's been such a good player. He just isn't the same anymore. And name value lingers. We've seen that with a lot of players. And at this point, like, there's just no point. There's no point in having him in a 12-team league. Let's talk about the top ads over the last 24 hours. Punch Bob was up 14%. Makes complete sense with Yanni Doubtful. He, he delivered today. Dorian Finney-Smith up 14%. His game was not too bad, apart from the shooting. He's okay as a 12-team league guy. Bembry up 12%. Well, you'd be pretty annoyed after you added him, and then he was suspended today. But... A double, uh, a double, double, shit. That's not what they're called. A back-to-back over the weekend. They might have some value for Benbury. Cole Anthony up 9%. I can co-sign that one. And Pat Williams up 9%. I guess it's just the back-to-back for the Bulls, but I wouldn't have him as a must-roster 12er. For drops, we're looking at James Johnson down 10%. Let's pour one out for Jimmy. All that's to say is yeah, you can drop him. Isaiah Roby down 7%. I do believe he will become an ad later on, but fine. Shake Milton down 7%. Don't know why he's still being rostered. Dwight Howard down 6 sure. And DeAnthony Mountain down 5 sure. Injured at the moment. And who knows what the hell Taylor Jenkins is going to do there. Let's look at the top 10 players rostered in under 50% of leagues. Corwell Pope with a big game today. I'm not buying into that, nor am I with Corey Joseph. Kenrich Williams, interesting 12-team stream, but we've highlighted how many issues with OKC with the amount of dudes that are out there. Rondo with a big one as well. I'm not buying into anything there. Same with Torian Prince, although Prince may be in 14-team leagues. Dean Wade, similarly, just really benefiting from Allen and Nance being out. Maybe there's a couple of games left of value there. Ty Jerome was good, but it's the same Oklahoma City problem. Where's Matthews benefiting from Kuzma being out? Don't read into that. Pat Williams, Solid enough game from Patty, but he's more of a 14-team league guy. And Kleber, again, more 14 than 12-team league player, in my opinion. Let's move on. DFS for Friday, we're looking at Fangio value. All right, so we've got nine games on Friday. The first one of those is the Pacers and the Magic. No spread or total out at this point. Miles Turner is out for Indiana. Sabonis and Brogdon are both questionable. So I don't know how much we're going to see of guys like Aaron Holiday. But most importantly, guys like uh, Gogo Badadze. For the Magic, Ken Birch is gone. Gary Harris is off the injury report, so Otto Porter's out. But we're going to see Gary Harris make his debut. So how the Carter Williams, Anthony, Harris, Hampton, Ross, the Sharp, Dwayne Bacon, James Ennis, how all those minutes work is really anyone's guess at this point. The Grizzlies and the Knicks, no Winslow, no Melton. Brandon Clark is doubtful again for Memphis, while uh, New York will be without Mitchie Robinson. The Grizzlies are one and a half point favorites here on the road. The total's really low, 213.5. While Boston takes on Minnesota next, the Celtics eight and a half point favorites, and the total's 228 and a half. Kimber Walker returns after resting last game. Tristan Thompson's back. Yvonne Fournier is out. While for Minnesota, Josh Okogie is probable. While Jalen Noel is doubtful. We still don't know what they're going to do with Russell or Rubio and uh, how that lineup is going to look. The Bulls and the Hawks. This is a back-to-back for Chicago. The Hawks are three-point favorites. The total is 227.5. Clint Capella and Danilo... Clint Capella and Danilo Gallinari are both questionable. Hunter, Collins, Dunn, uh, Reddish. They are all out for Atlanta. Philadelphia and New Orleans, um, still no George Hill for Philadelphia, while Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball are both questionable for New Orleans, as is Kyra Lewis, so some guard shenanigans potentially going on there. The Hornets and the Bucks, no uh, Ball and no Haywood, of course. I expect Jalen McDaniels to get another start. While for the Bucks, it is a back-to-back for them. Yanni did not play on Thursday, so his status is up in the air for Friday. Spurs and Nuggets, the headmaster Jamal Murray is questionable for Denver, while Lonnie Walker and Gorgie Jeng are both questionable for the Spurs. Keita Bates, Diop, and Trey Lyles are out for San Antonio. The Wizards and the Warriors, Bradley Beal is probable for Washington. Of course, Dan Gafford remains out. The Warriors, they're pretty healthy at this stage, while the Rockets and the Clippers, this is a back-to-back for the Clippers. For the Rockets, Johnny Wall is out with Achilles issues, while for the Clippers, again, it is a back-to-back. Maybe there's a chance Beverly doesn't play, and we don't know the status of Serge Ibaka, who's missed the last four to five years with a sore back. In terms of overall value on this slate, I like Wiseman, I like Bumba, I like Yanni if he plays, Jalen McDaniels, Robbie Williams a little bit, um, Ben Simmons, I like that his prices come down, I like Trey Young sort of, I like Jokic, I like uh, Wood, Curry, DeRozan, Valanchunas, I like maybe Kyra Lewis depending on Lonzo's status and Lewis's own status, Jalen Brown is alright, but Dadze could be a good option too. 
Um, Tatum looks okay, as does Paul George and Jaden McDaniels. Not too bad to wrap things up, guys. That'll do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, give it a thumbs up, and leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.